Hi there! If this is your first time here, welcome to the Parenthood and Relationship Podcast. I'm your host, Markella Kaplani, a psychologist, a parenthood and relationship coach, and a parent myself. Together, we explore the transformative journey of parenthood and its profound impact on our relationship with ourselves, our partners, and our children so that we can be present and show up as we envision without having to do more. Let's get into today's episode. Hey there, and welcome back to the podcast. I'm Markella, and today we're going to talk about a topic that is probably one of the main driving forces that led me down this path, that make me so passionate about supporting mothers emotionally, and that is that nagging feeling of guilt for craving anything else but motherhood. The messages we get throughout our entire lives, though very subtle, give us the impression that a mother only cares about her children, their well-being, and their future. That's it. And while all of that is true, it is not all that a woman cares about after becoming a mom. In fact, with the changes that occur at a brain level, after becoming mothers, our brain expands to include aspirations and a purpose that is much wider and bigger than us, so that we are not just protecting our babies in the now, but we are making the world a better place for them to exist in after we are gone. This episode is dedicated to all the incredible mothers out there who have fallen in love with motherhood, are in it 100%, but at the same time still feel the call, this pull, to do something more. And maybe that's not something that will help hundreds of people. Maybe that something more can be something like a calling to engage in other activities for the sake of self-regulating, for the sake of creative expression and making our family and extended family, friends, and colleagues also feel better because we are in a better place. And because of that, they are also in a better place. So grab a cup of coffee, my preferred choice, or tea, or whatever it is that helps you relax. And let's chat, my friend. Whether you're listening in your car, during a rare quiet moment at home, or on your daily walk, I hope this episode resonates with you and gives you a sense of compassion and understanding that I am so intent on passing on. Let me share a little story with you. When I first became a mother, I had this subconscious expectation that my multi-passionate nature would somehow take a back seat. Honestly, my husband was already concerned from the moment we conceived whether my passion to do and try many things would get in the way of the unpredictability and demands of motherhood. And he was on the spot, although I could not see it at the time. I think, like many of us, though I knew rationally how taxing motherhood can be in terms of how much time it requires of us, especially if we want to be as present as possible, I still bought into the notion that we can have it all. You know, I thought motherhood would be this all-consuming, completely fulfilling experience that would dampen my need to chase any other passions. And while it was, and it still is, all-consuming, and it was and still is so fulfilling, it is not all I need to do. I don't know, I imagined I'd be so immersed in raising my child that all my other interests would naturally fade away. But guess what? That didn't happen. Not at all. And it left me feeling disappointed in myself. Here I was, so in love with my son, more than anything in the world, but still feeling this strong, almost undeniable need to creatively release. But if I'm honest, that's not what I called it then. I saw my need to engage in both work as well as in hobbies as a selfish act. And especially when it came to hobbies, I saw it as a waste of time since, you know, it wasn't producing anything that was at least measurable or it didn't have some kind of reward like a monetary one that is widely valued. It took work to start to see what it is that hobbies and my love for my work offered me a way to regulate my nervous system, a way to meditate, a way to center myself. For a long while, I felt this painful split. On one hand, I wanted to dive into my personal projects and hobbies and my work, but the moment I did, I'd find myself missing my son like crazy. It was, and sometimes still is, to a much lesser degree though, a constant internal tug of war. And I know I'm not alone in this. Many of us thought that becoming a mother would be the ultimate fulfillment. But then we found ourselves still passionate about other things. 
And that's actually healthy. But that's also where the guilt creeps in. The shame of wanting to take time away from our kids to nurture that other part of our identity. It's tough, isn't it? When we've been told that motherhood is our ultimate calling, when we've been told that motherhood is selfless, that good mothers and proper women have this natural tendency to put everyone first because they were born to be nurturers, they were born to be caretakers. Some days I can handle it well. I feel like I'm in this perfect balance, like I'm strongly in my center and I'm able to accept that these standards we've been raised with are completely irrational when you look at them all together as a whole. The numbers just don't add up. Other days, the emotion kicks in. Parts of me that don't feel good enough struggle to accept that balance is the way to go. One part looks for confidence through my work, demanding I get insane results and not considering how the results that it wants to achieve cannot be accomplished with the limited hours of work or the limited support that I get or the fact that this is only one of many projects and work roles that I wear on top of being a mother. Another part demands that I let go of any other need and release myself into motherhood, ignoring the lingering need to nurture my other parts. So many mixed emotions. Some days it can get really overwhelming. When we pursue our passions, we are more well-rounded individuals. This in turn makes us better mothers because we are happier. And that is something that we pass on, that we mirror to our children. And we leave a legacy where our children don't have to grow up with the guilt that we keep carrying on our backs. So sticking with your passions and doing something about them, expressing them, in other words, I would dare say is not really an option, is not really uh, nice to have. It is our obligation because of how much it can help not only us, but also our children and the next generation. But how do you integrate all of this with your parenting responsibilities? I remember being in that state a couple of years ago when my son was only about two and a half and it was still so difficult. I'm not going to even discuss earlier than that. It was really difficult for me to hear the word balance and uh, trying to incorporate all these things. That's why I still avoid saying the word balance myself and tend to use words like incorporate because for a very long time it felt like what balance meant was something that was so out of reach. But I am not talking about you choosing one over the other. And I'm not talking about you splitting the time very precisely 50-50. It's about finding a harmonious way to pursue both in the way that makes sense for you and your family. Here are a few gentle and compassionate tips, ones that my therapist has to remind me of every once in a while. So while you listen to this, don't expect of yourself to always be able to apply them in the same way. Just find a way to keep yourself accountable. While therapy or coaching can be one of them, it's the way I've chosen, coaching doesn't have to be the only way. You can find another mama that gets you and has similar needs and you can keep each other accountable. You can get into a group program for moms which prioritizes community so you can find other moms that are there for the same reasons you are. That's also something I'm soon opening the doors to so check out the links in the description for more deets. But you can also quite simply, and if it works for you, write these down on a post-it and put them somewhere visible as reminders even on days that are tough. So here they are. First is prioritizing. Understand that you can't do everything at once. Choose one or two goals to focus on at a time and give yourself grace for the rest. For me, this has been the hardest. There are days where all logic flies out the window, days I feel insecure, and so I want to have been able to do all of it perfectly, fully, simultaneously. However, there is one thing I heard from Amy Taylor Kabaz in my training as a matrescence coach and activist, and this is the quote, your dharma will wait for you. And if you don't know what dharma is, it's basically our purpose, our calling. You can hear more about this in Amy's podcast episode with Deborah Poneman who talks about this topic, but I will be devoting an episode to this topic as well sometime in the future. Anyway, I mentioned this because for me, even before having my son, achieving things and going to the next accomplishment, the next target, milestone, call it what you want, was a race. 
I had to do it well. I had to do it as quickly as my perfectionistic tendencies allowed me because, well, there's so much to do. When a person like me, like you probably, has so many passions and ideas, time is never enough. So prioritizing and cutting back on stuff or not doing the entirety of certain things or even just putting some things on hold for a long time felt like a failure, like laziness or a waste of time. Now, the mother part of myself felt really offended by this, let me tell you. Like it was not seen, all the things that it was doing, all the time that parenting responsibilities were taking. Because it knows how much work and time and sweat and tears goes into showing up as a heavily involved mom. But there are days that I disregard this part altogether and I act as though it's not what I have prioritized, as if it wasn't my choice to prioritize this. Like it's not the greatest source of where my energy is funneled at the end of the day. What I'm trying to convey here is that while the tip is to prioritize, if you find that it is hard for you, there is nothing wrong with you or with your abilities. There are deeper reasons why this is happening. Like it could be possibly a need to feel valuable, a deep-seated belief that to be loved, you must have things to show for yourself, things you've achieved. It could be because an inner child has been taught that acceptance is conditional to how much we are able to take on and so forth. It comes from potential traumas, tiny or big, that have usually occurred when we were children and have a way of creeping up as we become parents, even if we have worked on them. And trust me, I have. There are always fragments that are left over because they did not cause much dysfunction, at least not extreme dysfunctions. They may have even stuck around because they're actually rewarded in the outside world. Being hard on ourselves, for example, and being super disciplined is rewarded because it gets the work done. And maybe you got a promotion because of that. But these fragments can and will become problematic as we step into motherhood and they will demand our attention. So yes, prioritizing and considering that your dharma will wait for you is a wonderful reminder, but also, if it is not really working all too well for you right now, that is an indication to step back and see what's getting in the way. What greater need might there be that trumps the already intense need for respite? Because only something bigger, more significant, more fearful even, will stand in the way of something that we really long to achieve. The next tip is time blocking. Allocate specific times in your schedule for your personal projects and for family time. If you know you have more support on certain days, do not wait for there to be a doctor's appointment or something like that to really need the time, to really have an excuse for it. Take that time anyway, every day or every week, whenever that time is. Having dedicated blocks can help you be more present in each role. Because honestly, switching hats all the time is exhausting and it takes a lot of mental energy that then gets in the way of being present or being productive at anything that we do. Finally, the last tip is involve your kids. Where appropriate and when appropriate, involve your children in your passions. If you love gardening, let them help. If you're studying, explain what you're learning and why it's important to you. Let them ride their bikes alongside you as you do some activity outdoors. All this models healthy ways of expression, which is a great service to them as well. At some point, I let my son out with me on the balcony where I was making things out of cement. When I got myself some pre-made molds, it was easier to get him to put some gloves on and get the cement mixture in the mold. I got to do my thing and to regulate and he was also so happy as well. If you choose any of these tips, just keep in mind that perfection is not the goal. That's a total note to self moment, by the way. But now it's time to go a layer deeper, identifying your personal goals and passions. We're going into talking all about self-discovery and giving yourself the space to recognize what truly lights you up inside. I know that we usually grab our journal at the end of the episode and that this is when we usually do prompts and self-reflections. But for this episode, please humor me. If you are in the car or you're washing the dishes and this is not something that you can do, please feel free to just ponder on the questions that I'm asking and come back to this episode later with your journal in order to take down some notes. Also, just so you know, every episode, I make sure that in the description, I include a link that leads you to a Google Doc, which has the full transcript. 
Therefore, you can just go ahead and skim and find where the questions are and do it that way as well. So here's the first question. What activities or goals make you feel most alive and fulfilled? Take a moment to think about activities that make you lose track of time. The ones that fill you with joy and a sense of purpose. These are the things that you do not because you have to, but because you want to. Maybe it's a creative pursuit like painting, writing, or playing music. Perhaps it's a professional goal like advancing in your career or starting a business. It could be something as simple as reading a good book, hiking in nature, or practicing yoga. Write down everything that comes to mind, even if it feels out of reach right now. And then consider this. How have your interests and passions evolved since becoming a mother? Motherhood changes us in profound ways, and it's worth reflecting on how it has influenced our passions. Maybe you've discovered new interests that you didn't have before. Maybe some of them were rekindled. Has becoming a mother given you a new perspective on your goals? For example, some women find a new passion for advocacy, wanting to create a better world for their children. Others rediscover a love for a hobby they enjoyed when they were kids. Jot down any new or rekindled interests you've noticed since entering motherhood. And finally, think about what small steps you can take to integrate these passions into your life. Big dreams start with small steps. It doesn't have to be huge leaps. And I think this is where most of us get stuck, at least for me, because I am quite innately a black or white type of thinker. For a very long time, it was hard for me to start doing something because I felt like it had to have a beginning and an end. It had to start and finish. And if it's a big project, it had to have big chunks that I could start and finish on a particular day to feel like I was doing something. Maybe it's dedicating 15 minutes a day to write in your journal, to sign up for an online course, or it might mean setting time aside on the weekends for a creative project. The key is consistency and giving yourself permission to invest in your interests. And by invest, I don't mean financially necessarily. I mean time-wise. I mean as a way of self-care and as a way of knowing that this is not something that is just whenever I have time left over. It's something that is really valuable to the entire system. And by the way, you might not know that there are even communities that promote this kind of accountability and inspiration for busy people. And I know you are definitely busy. So these communities are for people who want to commit to doing a project small steps at a time. My friend Artemis is creating this type of community here in Greece. I will link the information below if you are happening to listen to this. But there's also a version of this in the US and it's called Brainstorm Road, if you're interested. I mention this because it's really important to note that there are many people out there who want to channel their creativity to actualize their ideas, but they struggle to commit and to be consistent because life gets in the way. But when we put something down and even if we allot 5 to 15 minutes daily to it, it may seem like we're not moving the needle enough, but in the end, the project will be completed. Wishing for that time, which will be completely uninterrupted, and you can do something in one go, like I said before, that is not going to happen anytime soon. And what will we do with all that angst in the meantime? So I encourage you, write down a few small actionable steps that you can take to start nurturing your passions. And if you're having a hard time and it feels like, ugh, I don't even know what my personal passions might be anymore, let me give you some examples in hope that something resonates with you. Perhaps you're aiming to climb the corporate ladder, to switch careers, to start your own business, or to go back to school, for instance. In this case, you might set a goal to complete a professional certification or take a leadership role at work. If you are drawn to creative pursuits, consider goals like writing a book, painting a series of artworks, learning to play an instrument, or even starting a blog to share your creations. Maybe you've always wanted to take up a pottery class or to try your hand at photography, who knows? Your personal goals could also focus on your physical well-being. This might include training for a marathon, adopting a regular yoga practice, or even setting a goal to walk a certain number of steps every day. Perhaps you're interested in trying out new healthy recipes or joining a fitness group. And lastly, self-care is essential, and it can be a goal in itself. This could mean committing to a daily meditation practice, setting aside time each week for a relaxing bath, or dedicating time to read books that inspire you. You might also want to explore new self-care techniques like mindfulness or aromatherapy. 
Now, realistically, can these goals coexist with your parenting responsibilities? Well, they can, so long as we can be truthful to ourselves about how much we can get done according to the time and support we receive. We tend to have wishful thinking, and we tend to think along the lines of our former identity, pre baby identity, which in this case leads to a lot of disappointment. And there's nothing wrong with disappointment per se. But what is awful is that time and time again, I see that this disappointment turns into resentment and anger that is directed inwards with accusations targeting our essence, who we are, our worth. And that pains me because I know that pain. So if you're going to pursue a passion because you realize how much it will benefit you and the entire family system, make sure you're kind to yourself, that you give yourself grace, and that you consider all the current parameters. If they are not in your favor, if the time permitted is short and has to be extracted from a longer shower or 10 minutes of extra sleep, see what you're willing to sacrifice. Do not go into this uninformed. This is like having an open communication with ourselves, kind of like we foster the skill of open communication within the couple. Everything has to be set on the table. Being clear so that the other party can make an informed decision and take the responsibility of the situation, that is what we're aiming for. And the other party basically here is you, is those other parts of you that may be kind of objecting to this thing that you want to add on because they're really tired. But then there are those other parts that are saying, but if I don't do this, my mental health will suffer. I don't know why we do not converse with ourselves this way, but I definitely think we should. Because in that space that we leave open creeps in doubt and self-loathing that have no reason to exist. Not if the conditions are clear. Not if I can tell myself that I want to devote myself to X, Y, Z, but now I will have only five minutes a day or Only 30 minutes on a Saturday. And that's okay because it will not be like this forever. And I'm doing it for my well-being, not for anyone else and not for others' validation, not for my own validation, not to have anything to show for that time that I spend. And then after you communicate with yourself, ensure that you also communicate with your family about these needs and how they will holistically improve the family. And who knows, after discussing it with those around you who love you and support you, they might realize the value and you might end up having more time in the calendar to block out for your project after all. And even if you don't, helping others to understand and support your pursuits can act as an extra tool in dealing with the guilt and shame if it ever arises. And this gets me to the next thing that I want to discuss today, which is the guilt and shame that we feel and its origins. One of the biggest hurdles we face as mothers who are pursuing personal goals is guilt. This sneaky, pervasive feeling often creeps in when we least expect it. But where does this guilt come from? Why do we feel so intensely when we try to take time for ourselves? Guilt often stems from deeply ingrained societal expectations, as we've said before. We've been conditioned to believe that a good mother is one who is completely selfless, always putting her children's needs before her own. This idealized image of motherhood is unrealistic and damaging because it doesn't leave any room for our own identities and desires, for those other parts that are still there, despite the fact that we've experienced a profound transformation. Think about it. How many times have you heard something like, after becoming a mom, I realized how egotistical I was. Motherhood has really put my selfishness to the side, insinuating that now this person is completely selfless and that you should feel the same way if you want to relate to this image of a good mom. This kind of messaging is everywhere, in the media, from our family members, even in casual conversations with friends. And it's no wonder we feel guilty when we try to carve out a little space for our own passions. But... The idea that a mother should be completely self-sacrificing is not only outdated, it's harmful. It sets us up for burnout and resentment, which isn't good for anyone, not for us, not for our children, not for our families as a whole. We need to reframe this narrative. Being a good mother doesn't mean you have to give up who you are. In fact, pursuing your passions and taking care of your own needs can make you a better mother. When you are content, you have more energy, more patience, and more love to give. 
You become a role model for your children, showing them the importance of self-care and pursuing one's dreams. Now, let's talk about how we can start overcoming this guilt. It begins by affirming our own worth and accepting that our needs and desires are valid. Here are a few strategies that can help us on this journey. One of my top choices, though it's difficult for me to stay consistent as I have stated before, is of course journaling. Write down your feelings of guilt, examine where they're coming from. Are these feelings based on your own beliefs or are they influenced by external pressures? Understanding the source of your guilt can help you change it and reframe it. Second is self-compassion, which is oh so pivotal. Be kind to yourself. Motherhood is hard enough without the added burden of guilt. Acknowledge that it's okay to struggle and that you're doing your best. Something you would tell your friend, but not you, right? Well, let's change that. Then again, what can really help is a mantra and a quick meditation. Let's take a moment for a quick one minute meditation right here, right now. If you can, find a comfortable position and close your eyes. Take a deep breath in, hold it in for a moment, and then slowly exhale. Imagine a balance scale in front of you. On one side, place your parenting responsibilities. On the other, place your personal goals and passions and aspirations. With each breath, Visualize the scale balancing perfectly. Feel the harmony and peace that comes from this balance. Repeat to yourself, I am a better mother when I honor my own needs. I am a better mother when I honor my own needs. Take one more deep breath and when you're ready, open your eyes. Again, in this exercise, we're talking about a scale, we're talking about balance, but balance doesn't mean that if I am doing six hours of mothering in a day, I'm also doing another six hours of my passions. That's really not at all necessarily true. Balancing the scale is about how we feel. And it really is relative to the time and circumstance that we're in, in the moment. The scales tip all the time and we adjust. As I tell you this, I'm thinking of a client of mine. Let's call her Lisa. Lisa is a mom who rediscovered her love for painting after becoming a mother. Lisa always enjoyed creating art, but with the arrival of her daughter, she found herself struggling to make time for her creative pursuits. She felt guilty for wanting to spend time away from her daughter to focus on her art. But after some focused time and intensive internal work where we talked about who Lisa was as a child, who she was as an adult pre-parenthood, and who she was now becoming, Lisa began to accept and reconcile the many parts of her that needed to be heard and to be expressed. So she decided to start small. She set up a mini art studio in the corner of her living room and began painting for just 15 minutes a day. She involved her daughter by giving her her own sets of art supplies and encouraging her to create alongside her. This not only allowed Lisa to pursue her passion, but it also created a special bonding activity for her and her daughter. Over time, Lisa's short painting sessions became longer as her daughter became increasingly interested and able to maintain her focus on the activity for long enough, if you know what I mean. Yet, that's not the only reason why. When Lisa started seeing her time and how it is allotted as a choice, she gained agency and felt empowered. You see, when Lisa came to work with me, her biggest issue was this feeling of being trapped in a circumstance where others and situations outside of her control dictated what she would or could do, when she would do it, for how long she would do it. When she decisively said, this is how much time I want, not have to, but want, to spend with my daughter, it no longer felt as a constraint. It was a choice. It was a choice before too, obviously, yet now she could see that she chose it. She could see that it's a choice and she felt freed. She then gave herself permission to allot these 15 minutes a day without guilt. As a ritual of self-care and as a bonding activity with her daughter when she joined, it was not just like 
I do this whenever time is left over. It was 15 conscious minutes that she had set and they weren't by chance or whenever something just happened to get off of the schedule. Eventually, after a couple of years going at this, Lisa joined an online art community for support and inspiration and even started selling her artwork there. Lisa's story shows us that it's possible to nurture our passions while involving our children, turning our pursuits into a shared experience. And it really is possible, even though maybe it takes a little bit of a longer time to find success, whatever success means to us. If we look at this podcast, for example, I could easily tell you that it came to fruition late. The idea was conceived about two years ago, and yet it took this long for it to materialize. But so long as I kept on judging things as coming late, I was making the situation more difficult for myself. I felt more stressed. I felt more pushed. And while that may have worked with the Markella that I was in the past, a Markella who needed strict boundaries and sometimes even abusively structured guidelines that would help her perform, the Markella that I am now after becoming a mother is very, very resistant to this kind of treatment. She has been giving me such a hard time. She has made me question my discipline, my dedication, my abilities even. But here's the thing. While on the outside, this new version of me may have seemed like a negative outcome, while internally too, I struggled a lot with self-criticism, this new me that motherhood brought forth and is still bringing forth is an improved version. I can say that with confidence. It is much more compassionate. It is much more holistic, much more encompassing. It is done with being told off as a way to get moving. It is done accepting that progress comes from never feeling enough. Sure, it takes time getting used to when you've learned to function and even succeed in the world for 30 years by self-whipping. But this transformation is ultimately an opportunity for amazing growth. When I started taking more ownership of what was happening, when I told myself that the podcast will come one way or another when things are in place, because that's when it will be ready to fly. When I put everything down and felt it was a choice, then it was all different. I felt like I was strategizing around my projects. I felt empowered in the choices that I was making and the things that I wanted to be involved in. And the years that it took me to get from ideation to materialization weren't failures or indications of moving too slow or of not being ambitious enough anymore. They were a result of being strategic, a result of maintaining my goal to be present as a mother as I chose to be. They were the path that was right for me and my family. They were an indication that I stuck to my guns. I give you these examples because reframing your situation, if you too have ever felt trapped in your circumstance, can make a great difference. It took a lot of work to get out of this entrapped headspace. It felt like it was the ultimate truth of my reality. When I felt ready though, I sought help and my therapist's compassionate embrace and gentle reminders of what I was choosing to do and who I was choosing to be eventually sank in so that now as I continue my own healing journey, the days that I feel not enough because my pace has slowed down and my external visible produced results are not nearly as many as they were before, these days are so much fewer in comparison to the days that I feel content and empowered. Lisa's story and my own highlight that with clear boundaries, effective time management and the support of loved ones, but also deep compassion for ourselves, with those things in hand, we can definitely pursue our dreams without sacrificing our parenting responsibilities. We've covered a lot today, and I hope you're feeling inspired and empowered to pursue your personal goals unapologetically alongside your mothering responsibilities. Before we wrap up, I want to leave you with some words of encouragement. Remember that it's okay to want more for yourself. It's okay to have dreams and ambitions outside of motherhood. In fact, it's more than okay. It's essential for your well-being. By nurturing your passions, you're hitting two birds with one stone. Though, now that I said this expression, I feel really bad for the birds. You are enriching your own life, but also you are setting a powerful example for your children who need to see that all parts of us need to be seen and loved and held and valued, that we are multi-layered and that love shows up in many forms. 
Now, I want to challenge you to take action. Think about your personal goals and passions that we discussed today. Choose one small step you can take this week to start integrating your interest into your daily routine. Maybe it's setting aside 15 minutes a day for a creative project, like Lisa. Maybe it's scheduling a workout session or having a conversation with your partner about your needs and how they can support you. Consider entering a community like the one that my friend Artemis is offering or a coaching program, either one-to-one or an intimate group, where you can be with like-minded individuals wanting the same things as you do. Share your journey with me on social media by tagging me at markella.caplani, Markella is with double L, or using the hashtag unapologetically whole, W-H-O-L-E. Let's create a community of supportive, non-judgmental mothers who encourage each other to pursue our dreams. Your story might be the inspiration someone else needs to take that first step. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey today. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend who might benefit from this message. And don't forget to subscribe and leave me a review. It really, really helps and it shows me your appreciation. I hope this episode has given you lots of tools and confidence to start marrying your personal goals with who you are as a parent. Remember, you're not alone in this. We're all figuring it out together, one step at a time. Give yourself grace, take small steps, and celebrate your process along the way. Until next time, take care and keep striving for all the parts of you to feel loved and held. You've got this. See you next Sunday.